It's time for your daily LSU baseball update with Musso at the box. Now, Matt Musso. And welcome into another edition of Musso at the Box. LSU storms towards another weekend in the Southeastern Conference. This time they will travel to Alabama. We will get you a brief first look thumbnail on the Crimson Tide here on today's show. But the majority of this will revolve around a couple new Fields of 64 put out by Baseball America and D1 Baseball. I want to give you the very latest on where LSU stands, and we will look at a handful of teams around LSU as well, both in the Southeastern Conference and outside of the Southeastern Conference. It might be a little early to look outside of your bubble, and it's very clear what LSU needs to do. The number of conference wins has been clearly outlined But, of course, there are scenarios where you don't get there, and that's when you turn your attention to everyone around you on the bubble. So I do want to look through some of that. This conversation can get very dense. Like, it just can. There's a lot. That's the type of place that the bubble is. So what I've done is, like I said, I want to split it into the SEC teams and then the other teams. This is not – there's not going to be a test – This is just to give you as much information as possible. We will go through it, and I will make it as concise and as palatable as possible, but this is solely so you know where LSU stands heading in with now two weekends left. And again, the majority of it is going to focus on that. Y'all smash the like button. Get subscribed if you have not already to the YouTube channel. Get subscribed up on your favorite podcast app if you have not already, and let's dive right into it so looking at these fields of 64 in both of them in baseball america and in d1 baseball lsu remains in the first four out and that is absolutely the correct place for them right now that series went over texas a&m was massive and that's why you're better positioned in the first four out but that win that series win does not guarantee you anything what did jay johnson say earlier this week we're in the fight we're not in the field his words And he's absolutely correct. When you look at Baseball America, last week we went through their field of 64 projection. LSU was in the first four out, and they were the last team in the first four out. They were team 68. This week in that projection, LSU is team 67. So they've moved up one spot. Now, there's some interesting teams in front of them, again, that we can get into. For D1 Baseball, LSU again in the first four out, but it's team 66. So D1 Baseball higher on LSU's prospects moving up than baseball america uh is after the texas stadium series last week lsu was not included in the first four out for d1 baseball so they went to being well out to knocking on the door just the second team out of the field all very good things so where does lsu stand going forth into this weekend it's clear right 13 conference wins If LSU gets the 13 conference wins with their RPI, it is widely thought that they will be in. I think that as well. I don't think you're a lock, but I think it's good enough in this era, this season of SEC baseball, where where, uh, 13 out of the 14 teams have a top 50 RPI that is unheard of, and that's what you're dealing with, that that is good enough to get you in. There's still a shot where LSU can get to 14 conference wins if you take two out of three against Alabama and sweep Ole Miss or sweep Alabama and take two out of three. You just you have to win five out of your last six to do that. Maybe not likely, but certainly possible. And if LSU does that, if they get to 14 and 16, they're a lock. It, it is done. And then there's the other caveat where LSU, if you don't get to... um. You know, if you lose the series at Alabama and then only take two out of three against a uh, Ole Miss or you get swept somewhere along the way and you fall short of that 13, you'd need to do work in the SEC tournament. We've talked about that a game or two, and you would have a resume that is worthy of selection. Would it get you in? That would have to be determined by what happens around the country, bid stealers and all that. So that's where LSU stands. Who are the teams that they're competing with? Let's start in the SEC. And we will start with the Florida Gators. Florida has probably the most cut. Well, I don't want to say that. Alabama does. But Florida's path is an interesting one because their metrics are great. Like, Florida right now's RPI is ranked 24th. 
They have the number one strength of schedule. They have 10 quad one wins. Their metrics are phenomenal. But there's two things that hurt Florida. Number one, their overall record stinks. Florida's overall record is 25 and 23. We talked about this a bit last week. You have to have a winning record. You have to be above 500 to be an at-large bid in the NCAA tournament. That is a requirement, a prerequisite. You might say, well, hey, there's teams that get in with losing records. Tulane last year got in with 19 wins. Tulane won their conference tournament. They got an automatic bid. To get the at-large, it is required that you have a record above 500. Like You want to talk about a a team where midweek games mattered down the stretch? (laughs) The Florida Gators, because they needed any win they could get to get their record above 500. But there are only two games, and they're not out of the out of the uh, woods yet. So that's one hurdle for them. The other is they need three more conference wins. And when you look at Florida's remaining schedule, it's probably the toughest out of the teams we're going to talk about in the Southeastern Conference that LSU is competing with. The SEC in both of these projections have 10 teams in. That ties the record. They have a shot to get 11. And we'll go through how that happens. But looking at Florida, needing three wins in their last six, and if they get that, they'd have 13 wins, they'd have their 500, uh, above 500 record, and they would be in because the rest of their metrics are incredible. But this weekend, Florida plays Kentucky. They get it at home, but they play Kentucky, who's who's leading the Southeastern Conference race right now. At home, that's a series that Florida could steal, Kentucky's road schedule has been relatively soft so far this season. Just throwing that out there. But then Florida has Georgia on the road to close the season. You're looking at two top 15 teams. Now, again, like we said, if Florida gets their three wins in their last six, they'll have their record, they'll have the conference wins, and they're in. If they don't, Florida's the team that could be left on the outside looking in here, at least one of them from the Southeastern Conference. It's not a guarantee for Florida by any stretch because they have arguably the toughest road. We'll get to Ole Miss, whose Myers might be tougher, but two top 15 teams, I'll go with that as the toughest road, and Florida has two big hurdles to clear. Now, you look at Alabama. Alabama has the most cut-and-dry path to the NCAA tournament of these teams. Right now, Alabama's RPI is 13th. Their metrics are great. Top five strength of schedule at number four, 12 quad one wins. Their metrics are great. They're 10 and 14 in the league like Florida. They need three wins in their last six games. They have LSU, and then they're at Auburn, who has not won a series all year in conference play. Even if Alabama loses the series to LSU but steals one, all they have to do is win two out of three at Auburn. Alabama feels like they are in a really, really good spot. That's not to say they're not going to play hard against LSU. Of course they are. Alabama at at Baseball America is projected as a three seed. It's not like they're squarely in the field. Now, Baseball, uh, now D1 has them as a two. But it's not like they're squarely in the field. But... They have the most margin for error out of any of these error, I should say, out of any of these teams that we're talking about in the conference. So I think it's safe to say Alabama, you're probably in. You're not a lock, but you're you're probably in. You should feel good about where you are. LSU. We just went through everything for LSU. With LSU's metrics, where they are, if they win four out of their last six, get to 13 conference wins, it, they're they're going to be in, and you know who those teams you like. You know who LSU has left. Let's talk about the Ole Miss Rebels. Ole Miss is a team with incredible metrics. They're not a great team, specifically on the mound, but they have great metrics. Ole Miss's RPI is ranked twenty sixth. They have nine quad one wins. They have the number two strength of schedule in the country. And that's only going to get better. 
The problem for Ole Miss looks like it could be conference wins. That's not true. The problem for Ole Miss is conference wins. Ole Miss is nine conference wins. They're in the same spot as LSU. The problem for them, they have to face Texas A&M this weekend. A walking wounded Texas A&M that's licking their wounds after losing, dropping a road series at LSU. Ole Miss's pitching staff is not good. A&M's lineup is very good. And Swayze Field is a small park. That favors Texas A&M. If Ole Miss loses that series, they're going to be in a heck of a spot to have to come into Baton Rouge. If Ole Miss gets swept, they're done. They're done. Excuse me. It's a rough road for the Rebels. So I look at this. I say the most likely teams from the SEC or Alabama and LSU. Because Florida's facing the two top 15 teams to close. Ole Miss has to face Texas A&M and then has to face a really hot LSU team. And we've already established that I think Alabama's like, is, is out of all these teams we just went through in the SEC is the closest to just feeling solid. Here's where the history comes in. The history comes in if Florida gets three wins, Bama gets three wins, and LSU gets four, which is plausible. Because in that scenario, with the strength of this conference, I don't see how any of those teams get left out. And you would end up with 11 SEC teams in the field, which would be the most ever. And that's why 13 wins is the benchmark this year. We talked about, you know, 14 is normally that lock. 70% of conference teams in the SEC that got to 14 wins since 1999 have been in. It's 38% at 13. But this year, in this year's SEC, with as strong as it is, with the RPIs that are in it, 13 is the new 14. And that's how you potentially get 11 teams in. That's how you break the record. You need a, 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 an outlier of a year, and that's what this is in the Southeastern Conference. That's more than possible. I think Florida can beat Vanderbilt. Excuse me, I think Vanderbilt. I think Florida can beat Kentucky at home. And if they do that, they need to just win one game on the road at Georgia, and they're in. This is as close as you can get to having 11 in. And that's the path, is if LSU, Bama, and Florida all get to 13 wins, they're all three going to be in, and the SEC will set a record. Now, hope that came across clearly. The teams that LSU is competing with for spots outside of the conference. And there's a few of these that I think are absolutely ridiculous. And again, I will throw out the disclaimer. If LSU gets to 13, none of this matters. They should be in. Especially if those 13 come with a series win over Alabama. Let's start with Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina, not long ago, was a host. And it's a great program. We know that. National championship program. Not recently, but national championship program. The problem for Coastal now is they're in an eight-game losing streak. And that has taken them firmly out of hosting contention as you might imagine. They have a sub-500 record in conference. They have a good RPI. They have a good strength of schedule. Their metrics are good. Conference wins are a problem. Now, it's not totally you know, unmanageable for them down the stretch. They play Georgia State, and they play Marshall. Looking at their RPI, they're, they're 30th, 30th in the RPI. And Georgia State is 102. Marshall is 204th. But they do have a game with Clemson in there as well. They probably won't win that. But if Coastal Carolina can snap out of this funk that they're in, 
win those two series, that'll get them above 500 in, in, a, in the Sun Belt, which is a strong league, and they could cause problems for you if you're LSU sitting on the bubble. Because at that point, Coastal's probably going to be in. Another team to look at is St. John's. And this is one of the ones I have a problem with. St. John's is getting a lot of love because they're second in the Big East. The Big East is not a good league. It, it's just not. You have three teams in it that are respectable out of, out of the whole thing. Um, St. John's resume is bad. Like, their metrics, their resume isn't good. I'm pulling it up here for you. St. John's RPI is 53rd. 53rd. Their strength of schedule is 149th. They have four quad one wins, but they're 11 and four in the Big East and second, so they're getting bouquets thrown to them. It gets better, by the way. Like, LSU's resume, LSU's metrics so far and away outweigh St. John's. But if you want to dig even deeper, how about the common opponents between these two teams? Because there's plenty. St. John's opened the season in Gainesville. Two of the games got rained out, and the one game they played, they beat Florida. LSU played three games against Florida. How many did LSU win? One, so that matches up. St. John's played a three-game series against Xavier. They beat Xavier two out of three. LSU played a three-game series against Xavier. How'd that work out? LSU won two out of three. St. John's played Texas. They lost 15 to four. LSU played Texas. How'd that work out? LSU dominated them. Texas scored some garbage run late and made it look closer. Common opponents are the same except for LSU beating Texas, you losing. Your RPI is some... Almost 20 spots below, yet St. John's is projected to be in this field because they've won over 30 games and they're second in a bad league. That's stupid. Get to 13, it doesn't matter if you're LSU. I understand. But the fact that if LSU doesn't and their resume is just flat out better, and you could say, well, they play in a better league. Okay, I don't care. Good. Put more, put the better teams in from the better leagues. They're the better teams. By metrics, talent, everything. I don't understand the love for St. John's. I don't. Other than other than their conference record. The problem is the Big East sucks. It's not good. When we get into bid sealers a little bit later on, hopefully we don't have to, but if we do, we'll come back to the Big East because Georgetown could ruin everything. The Big East being a multiple bid league shocks me. I like I, I don't I don't understand. I, I really don't. Um I really don't get that that much. Let's move on from St. John's. Let's go to Indiana. Indiana stinks. They're not good. Um, Indiana's RPI is 60th. Their metrics are okay. But the problem is for Indiana is what they have left. Indiana, the RPI is the biggest issue for them. Indiana needs to win six of their final seven to have a chance to get their RPI into the top 45. They face Nebraska this weekend, who's a top 25 RPI team. That would obviously help. But after that, you, you face Michigan. And it's not, you have to sweep one of those weekends. That's not likely. So if Indiana doesn't do that, and they don't have a top 40 RPI, sure, they're in a decent spot in the Big Ten, tied for second place, but you could drop down those standings as well. And the Big Ten isn't a good baseball league. Keep an eye on Indiana, though. Let's talk briefly about the Utah Utes, shall we? Utah is part of the first four out in the Baseball America projection. They're in the field for D1 baseball, and I think they're firmly in the field for D1 baseball. Let me double-check this, give a quick scroll here of this, the Utah Utes, the Utah Utes, where are you at? There are three seeds. So they're not firmly in. They're three seed in both, rightfully so. The Pac-12, not a good baseball league. 
Utah's big problem is also the RPI. The Utes don't have an opportunity. Like, they don't have a projected path per Boyd's world to get into the top 45 in the RPI. And that's with playing Arizona this week, who's 33rd in the RPI right now. Oh, look, LSU's RPI just moved up a spot to 35. It's it's live, y'all. It's crazy how it happens. But Utah's got a good conference record, and that's why they're getting love. But if Utah can't get into the top 45 in RPI, conference record be damned in the, in the, big, in the Pac-12. You saw last year USC, who was third in the league, get left out. You saw Arizona State, who was fourth in the league, get left out for an eighth-placed Oregon team. Because the Pac-12's not a good league. The metrics for Utah aren't terrible, but RPI is a problem, and they lean heavily. The committee leans heavily on RPI, so you know, keep that in mind. Pay close attention to that Utah series against Arizona. Arizona this weekend, they lose that Utah's out of this field. They have to be. They absolutely have to be. Let's talk about Georgia Tech and Louisville real quick. Let's end with the, with the ACC. And then we'll get you a quick look on Bama and we'll get out of here. Quick first look on Bama. We'll have the, the full preview coming up shortly. Scroll through to get to my ACC notes here. Hold on. All right. Georgia Tech. A number to watch in the ACC is 16 wins. We talk about the ones in, in the SEC. 16 is, is the one to watch. You got to also remember, they play an extra weekend. They play an extra weekend of conference action. Um, one more than the SEC. So that's why the numbers are a little different. So 16 is the number there. Georgia Tech sits at 12 and 12 right now. They have an RPI uh, in, the, in the mid-40s or so do the Yellow Jackets. Uh, 48 right now currently as I look at it. A top 40 strength of schedule. So, I mean, that's a good metric. Six... Six conference wins. The thing for them is can they get to 16 wins? If Georgia Tech can get to 16 wins, it's it's possible that they they obviously sneak in. Georgia Tech is in the um the last, or excuse me, the first four out. Or I'm sorry. Georgia Tech is in D1 baseball's um last four in. They are team number 61. 60. Team 60. Excuse me. Um, now baseball America has Georgia tech in the next four outs. There's some disagreement there about the yellow jackets, but if they get, if they get to uh 16 conference wins, they should feel good, which would put them four and two in their final, uh, six conference games. The problem there is they face Duke and then they're on the road at Florida state. They face two top 10 teams. That's a really, really tough road. So, just keep an eye on Georgia Tech. The metrics are good. Conference wins are their biggest issue. Lastly, Louisville. We talked about Louisville last week. Their RPI was in the 70s. It's not anymore. They got a big series win. Um, and and they're, they're uh, well, I shouldn't say series win. But, well, no, I should. They did. They swept Boston College. That was helpful. And it skyrocketed their RPI. The interesting thing about Louisville is what they have remaining as well. They have plenty of opportunity. Like, Louisville is a team to watch, not even just from an LSU perspective. If LSU doesn't get to 13, Louisville is just a team to watch in general When you, if you're interested in the NCAA tournament because they did lose a game to Vanderbilt, which would have boosted their RPI, but they're at North Carolina for three games. It's a top 10 RPI team. It's the 11th ranked team in the country. Then they face Indiana, who we already mentioned in this, and then they face Notre Dame. Louisville has a lot of opportunity. The RPIs of those teams... 6, 60, 51. And Notre Dame could be a top 50 team in the RPI by the time they get to that final week. Louisville could shoot up. They're, they're a really interesting club um, to watch. They're 13 and 11 in, in the ACC. So a strong conference, a strong conference record. That's where Louisville gets their love from. And they absolutely could get to 16 conference wins. And if they do that, 
they will be well in the top 50 of the RPI. They'll have finished pretty strongly in a in the second best conference in the country, and I think Louisville would be in. So that's a little further down the road, but they are definitely a team to watch if LSU does not get in, and LSU's really fighting on the bubble uh, there through conference tournament weekend. Keep an eye on Louisville. Again, this could change. I said it's early to kind of look at those teams. Um, I also really just wanted to yell about St. John's resume because it's bad, and I think it's stupid that they're being rewarded for um, being second in a conference that I believe has the seventh RPI in the country and is be- like is behind the Big Ten, who's also not good. Um, that kind of stuff just bothers me. Uh, it, you'll remember the tirades I went on about NC State a few, uh, not NC State, East Carolina uh, in 2022 because they hosted and just absolutely did not have a, a host-worthy resume other than winning the American. Um, so those those things, like I said, those things bother me. Um, should they? Probably not, but they do. All right, let's get you a, a quick, brief first look at Alabama. The full recap will come later. Um, yeah, the Big East is seventh. They're behind the Pac-12. Stop. Stop. Their highest ranked team by RPI is Connecticut at 44th. Stop it. It's a bad league. It is It is not a good league. Um. All right, we're moving on. Alabama. So, look, I hope that was concise. I hope that was informative. I hope you now have a better, a better view. We went through a lot of teams outside. I get it. That was just as a precaution. Get to 13 if you're LSU, and the rest should take care of itself. To do that, they need to at least win one game against Alabama. You can't get swept. When looking at the Tide, Alabama is a team that is offensive heavy. Like, the pitching staff is not great. They've shuffled their rotation a little bit last week. Give you a bit of a preview on that. So, Greg Ferrone is stuck at, at Friday night. They moved Zane Adams up last week. Zane Adams is a freshman lefty that we mentioned earlier this week who had been dominant for them in game number three. So they moved him up into Ben Hess's spot. Hess is their former ace. He went down with injury last season. That's one of the things that forced Luke Holman into that number one role for Alabama last year. He's obviously back this year, but it hasn't been good. I mean, he's got an ERA just a tick below seven. It's 6.98. They moved him into the Sunday spot. Now, the interesting thing is with that flip, Zane Adams did not fare well. He gave up four earned on five hits in five innings against Mississippi State, and they lost that ball game eight to one. Now, is that enough for them to flip those two back? Maybe. But the thing that Alabama, and maybe not, the thing that Alabama has had a lot of success with is game number three. Alabama has won their last Again, hold on. I want to make sure I have it right here. Um, One, two, three, four. Their last four game number threes. And in those, three out of the four, they've scored 10 runs. For LSU, we'll reiterate this in the full preview. LSU needs to win the first two games of this series because I don't like their chances against this Alabama offense in game number three at all. And by the way, those victories are against the likes of Arkansas. They scored five there. A&M, where they scored 10. Ole Miss, where they scored 10. And Mississippi State, where they scored 10. Those are some pretty good pitching staffs in Mississippi State and Texas A&M and Arkansas, for that matter. Of course, they only scored five, but you get the point. Alabama's offense, they're led by Gage Miller. We'll talk plenty about him. He's uh, scored 63 runs. That is by far tops on this Alabama team. At one point, he led the country this year in runs scored. It was during the first half of SEC play, but he's fallen well behind the pace there. When you look at Alabama's offense, you're looking at five 300 hitters. You're looking at some familiar names, a guy like T.J. McCants, who transferred over from Ole Miss. He's at Alabama. You're looking at a lineup that's hit over 80 home runs this year. It's a strong offensive club. Their weakness is on the mound. Alabama's got an ERA north of seven in conference play. That's why I can look at this and say, okay, they're not good at pitching. 
LSU just had some great timely hits and effort against a very good pitching staff, a very good bullpen in Texas A&M. And what LSU is doing the best right now can travel, and that's pitch. That's why I can look at this and go, LSU has a shot here because they're pitching so much better. It's what we've been talking about for three weeks now. Really longer than that. Because you can go back to the midweek. It, after they got run ruled by Vanderbilt, LSU started pitching better. They did. That carries you through those midweek games where you had two or three shutouts, the weekend at Tennessee where you pitched really well, and then everything subsequent to that that we've seen. So you've seen it travel on the road at Tennessee. You've seen it travel on the road at Missouri. You've seen it at home. Can it travel to Tuscaloosa and stifle a really good offense? And the difference between the Tennessee series and potentially right now is you're facing a bad pitching staff, which could lead you to more offense. We'll go a much bigger deep dive, but that's kind of what I just wanted to touch on. They flip-flopped their rotation, so I'll be very interested to see when we do this uh, in the next, few, uh, the next day to preview this series if they stick with that. And I wanted to kind of just say I, I like LSU's chances of the pitching, traveling, and them having success against Alabama's offense. So there's your brief thumbnail on the Tide. Full preview comes on the next episode. Y'all smash the like button. Get subscribed if you haven't already to the YouTube channel and on your favorite podcast app. Share. That's always appreciated. Follow me on social media. That's always appreciated. And be here next time for more on Muso at the Box.